Chul3D represents about 20% of all neurology consultations, and yet it's still massively underdiagnosed, poorly treated, and in fact, huge numbers of people don't even know it exists. Most people with dizziness just walk around thinking they've been diagnosed with chronic anxiety, BPVD, vestibular migraine, stuff like that. And often the diagnosis to triple PD is massively delayed, which delays their recovery. So there's been a new article that came out in August 2025. So it's brand new for part of the press. And hopefully it's going to help us understand a little bit more about why it happens and open a window into what treatment should look like. So uh, Ben, you know more about this than most people. You had it yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it could definitely come from, from a set, sense of empathy. Yeah, absolutely. So the the symptoms of triple PD, I mean, you can describe better than anyone else. So why don't you tell me about what, what it's like then? Yeah, with triple PD, it's a bit of an odd, it's, it's an odd one because most people will obviously describe it to people as it's very much an invisible illness because you can't see it. Generally, people's balance is absolutely fine, but you just don't feel like that's the case. Most people will, well, myself included, would, would have experienced the kind of, whether it's like you walk on a trampoline or it's a sense of unsteadiness or you feel like you could fall, but the, the risk of falling is no higher than, than anyone else in the, in the general population. But for a lot of people, it's also that internal sense of a swimmy feeling or as if they're moving, but it's different to other conditions of dizziness like BPDD that people talk about, or it's quite a common one where they get that spinning sensation. It's not often that people will get the spinning, but they'll get some other sensation of movement or, or imbalance. Yeah, absolutely. So when we call it that, it's that non-spinning vertigo. So vertigo is that sense of movement. So people might feel like they're bobbing, rocking, swaying. Um, some people, did you ever have this? To get some feeling of dropping. So they'd be on their computer and like scrolling up or down on the screen and suddenly have a sense of like they're dropping forward. The elevator drop feeling. Yeah, horrible. Horrible. Uh, yeah. So um, when we're looking at the diagnostic criteria for chill PD, really it's that persistent dizziness that can wax and wane over the day, but it lasts for at least hours at a time. But for most people, it's most of the day. Now, you can just have to try out the full beds. Do you know if you go and lie down, um, lie down in bed or lie on the sofa, the symptoms stop or get much better? Did you have the same thing, Ben, or were yours just fairly constant, whatever you did? No, you very much wax and wane, like you say. I know they talk about upright posture is generally worse. Lying down for the for most of the time, or even sitting down was generally better. But yeah, once you're up, or for me, it was passive movement was was an unpleasant one, or active movement of of the head. But you'd often find it would wax and wane a lot, and sometimes, like get a lot of people for no apparent reason, you can just get a sudden worsening in symptoms out of the blue. Yeah, and that's I think one of the most frustrating bits, right? You could be doing nothing offensive, so you've yeah. kind of figured out that being upright is worse than lying down, and movement is worse than just staying still, like sitting in a chair. Um, and that you know, if you go to a busy supermarket or somewhere with lots of visual stimulation, it's worse. But it's so frustrating if you're doing nothing particularly, you're sitting in, in you know sitting in a chair, minding your own business, maybe reading a book, and then suddenly start feeling like that rocking gets much worse. It can just be so so frustrating. You're like I haven't even done anything. Like I'm not doing anything bad. Um, and unfortunately, that psychology starts to build up, right? That that frustration aggravates the stress, which aggravates the dizziness, and this thing just winds itself up. And that's the thing, because a lot of people do get frustrated with, they may have heard it from other people, well-meaning, where mm -hmm. it's, you know, perhaps it's your anxiety mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and, and what most people, and for myself included, would have been, the dizziness often starts sometimes without an obvious cause. Sometimes there's an obvious trigger, but sometimes it will start. But often then it's the the psychological aspects that then can worsen that and turn it into a spiral. And as we're now finding, maybe one of the big things is actually persisting as well as amplifying the symptoms as well. Yeah, absolutely. So the, this paper um, is looking at these psychological factors that mediate triple PD. So it's a really interesting one. And one of the interesting bits they found there is that in younger populations, anxiety can often be the trigger. And in older populations, it's often other forms of dizziness. So you have a vestibular migraine or an ear infection like vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis or maybe BPPV like there's crystals in your ear. So you have this onset of, of disruption in how the vestibular system works. And then the brain has these maladaptive processes. So it then says, okay, my, well, actually I see maladaptive, really it's adaptive. So if my, if I can't trust my ear because it's not working properly, it's totally normal to say, right, okay, I can't trust my ear. You know, my right is not saying the same as my left. So I'm going to use my vision more in the short term to try and get me through this. Exactly the same as if I broke my leg, I'm going to put in a cast, put in a crutch, uh, put in a crutch, start using a crutch. And then once the bone is healed, you know, I'm going to get rid of that and, and carry on walking. It would only be maladaptive if my bone was fully healed and I continued to use the cast and I continued to walk with a crutch. And unfortunately, that's what happens in triple PD is that 
uh, people have this adaptive response where the system's not working, it hopefully then heals over time. And yet the brain continues to say, I'm going to continue to ignore my vestibular system as much as possible. I'm going to learn vision more. Um, and that means you're prone to these tricks of light, color contrast, depth perception, all these sensory reference points. So whenever you're turning your head, your brain is using these re uh, references around you to understand how fast you're moving. Um, and so if we're someone that has lots of vertical lines or lots of horizontal lines, it gives you that visual sense of acceleration, which is why the supermarket is just so horrible. Um, so Ben, when you had it, was there any, I remember talking to you about it and you were saying just talking to people was making you feel dizzy. Like if you were talking face to face with someone like this, you were like, oh, I could just feel myself swaying around the whole time. I was going to say, I wouldn't have, back then, a few years ago, wouldn't have actually been able to do this sort of a video call sort of format combination of people moving but also then me having to move along with it but it is it's that combination of like when you see something moving like you say there's so much overlap with a lot of these chronic conditions where as you said it starts adaptive it's that the body's doing the right thing for you but after a while you've had that time the original insult so to speak has gone but now you start seeing someone moving in front of you like you say in in person over video and Although you might not necessarily notice it at the time, but realistically what's happening is, is your brain is saying, is that me moving or is that someone else moving? And it just can't seem to get those systems to cooperate properly or at least interpret interpret them appropriately. So yeah, people moving was awful, especially because when, when you're in front of someone, they're usually a lot closer to you. Same with the computer screen. And it's just filling up so much of that visual field, a uh, field of vision. And, it's, and again, you just get that sensation of, hang on, is it me moving or are they moving? Yeah, so yeah exactly very different right. escape. Yeah, exactly right. They found that in the young populations, anxiety or stress was one of the big factors. And again, that doesn't mean it's all psychological, like it's all in your head type of thing. What happens when you're anxious, when you're stressed, is our pupils are going to dilate. So to let more light in. But the point of letting more light in is it means we get more light to uh, the rods that go around our eye that are more sensitive to motion, which is really important, right? So if you imagine our stress response is the same for a... A uh, tiger being let into this room as a bad, uh, an unwanted email or an unexpected bill or breaking my leg. The stress response is all the same. So, unfortunately, evolution has primed us so when we have any kind of stress, our pupils dilate, so we're more motion sensitive. It, ideal, right? So, if I was talking to you right now and I'm and uh, a tiger comes into the room, I want to see that with my peripheral vision as soon as possible, so I'm be like, "Whoa, what is that?" Rather than waiting for it to come around to the in front of me, so I can be like, "Oh wow, a Bengal tiger. That's pretty scary." So unfortunately, when we're, when we're stressed, we have this increased uh, visual perception. And, and unfortunately, the brain, the human brain is prone to using our vision for threat detection. So for that exact reason. So if you said, hey, Jay, I've let a poisonous snake into your room, I probably wouldn't close my eyes and like listen for the snake. And I probably wouldn't reach around my hands and legs and try to feel for it. I'm going to look for it. So unfortunately, when we're more, when we're under stress, we start relying more and more on vision. We call it visual dependency. Uh, and that can really create this horrible feedback loop that because you're so emotion sensitive, you feel more stressed and because you feel more stressed and more emotion sensitive. So they found in this study that with younger people, it's often anxiety and stress, but we know that it's been a stressful for years. So, so trip PD has, has just absolutely skyrocketed the last few years. Really? So this paper is a really fascinating one. So what they did is they took a whole bunch of people, um, for instance, from the, uh, um, university, uh, university college of London. So it's a well-established, you know, respectable place. And they basically took 59 people with triple PD and they compared them to 89 healthy uh, controls. So people that have any dizziness at all. And uh, then did like some extra little tests where they compared it to 16 people with um, bilateral vestibulopathy. Now I tend to get a bit tongue-tied, so I'm going to say vestibular hypofunction just to say, save me saying that over and over. Vestibular hypofunction basically means, bilateral means that both sides have been damaged. The reason that's such a good comparator is when you have damage to both sides, unfortunately, that's a chronic condition, very hard to resolve that dizziness. So you've got uh, a group of people who are perpetually dizzy, always feel a bit unsteady and, and rocking, bobbing, swaying, um, very similar symptoms to triple PD. However, in triple PD, there's often nothing wrong at all. So there's been no, well, it may have been damaged, but it's recovered or there's no finding at all. So that's again, why it's so frustrating because you you go to your neurologist and you have all your testing done, you have the MRI and you have the test D and you have the Clorox, you go to all these horrible tests and they're like, hey, it's totally normal. So it's a little bit different to um, vestibular hyperfunction where they do this and say, oh yeah, there's actually reduced function there. So they took these different groups and they basically then exposed them to 12 different questionnaires, all looking at uh, psychological factors, cognitive factors and dizziness severity. 
and really interesting they they came out with kind of what the key identifiers were and the the big one really was that people with triple pd have this uh higher uh, significantly higher sense of injustice and that their condition is irreparable so that they feel the symptoms are unfair and that they're never going to get better and that was the number one finding out of, of all these different psychological assessments they did and all the different things the number one predictor for um severity of symptoms was how much someone kind of rages against the condition and that's uh, before this paper came out there's something you and me have discussed quite a few times is you see that personality type and 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 you see that with recovery that the people who really hate their symptoms and really rage against it and spend a lot of time talking to us about you know quite bitter about it they're the ones who take the longest to recover the ones who can get into a state of acceptance and start to see it as yeah, it sucks. I'm not having a good day now. But actually, just like you said at the beginning, Ben, actually, I've never fallen over from this. I've never actually got hurt. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not the person I want to be, but actually, I'm not in danger. They're the ones who, when they can start to get to a point of symptoms, actually, their symptoms drop off massively. And that's what this paper found is that, you know, the, the more you fight it, it's just not fair, but the, the more you fight it, the, the worse it is. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, they did a whole bunch of assessments on this and that was the the biggest one really by by far. Um, so nearly everyone, so 89% of people with triple D scored very, very highly in this uh, in this sense of unfairness. Um, and the second one that was the, the main differential between um, vestibular hypofunction and healthy controls was that visual dependency. So the, the big one was that basically being in any space where there's lots of visual reference points makes them feel dizzy. So when you had a bend, did you score? I can't remember when we used to, we, we talked a lot when Ben had, did you have that, that kind of, that feeling of unfairness that, cause you were like, you were super fit. So and for people who don't know Ben, Ben is like a national level gymnast. Uh, you know, where did you come in the world championships, Ben? Uh, third in the junior world championships. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just amazing. So you were super fit. And I remember you sending me these videos, you doing these most outrageous, like tumbles and flips and all this kind of stuff. And then they like, yeah, I'm still dizzy. Like what? <laughs> It definitely highlighted, though, how, like, Trip PD, it really showed that side of it where there's clearly not a dysfunction in uh, the, how my vestibular system was working to be able to be able to do those things. But there was a severe uh, symptom to it of, of the sense of fogginess and fuzziness and motion sickness that I'd never had prior to um, my tumbling career prior to that. So, yeah, the, the sense of unfairness was huge given where I'd been what had then happened, the fact that it stopped me from, it took me away from this identity of what I was as kind of an you know, elite athlete at that point um, and took away from that. And it, 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 and it kind of, yeah, you can't understand how that can possibly happen to you. And then uh -huh. you realize after a couple of months, I think I said to you last week about this, is like, you, at first you assume it will just, ah, it's fine, it will go away. Then it stays there for a couple of months and you think, oh my God. Am I one of these people that ends up with one of these lifelong conditions that just never goes away regardless of what you do? And yeah, you start to realize, and particularly obviously from working with you, how many years ago it was when it first kind of began, actually realizing to both accept that they were there and learning mm -hmm. to sit with the symptoms, mm -hmm. realize, and, and admittedly this is easier said than done and takes time, but realize oh. that actually this does pass because of its waxing and waning nature. It does pass. Becoming aware of how many times I've actually done something and the symptoms weren't triggered. And yes, there were times and of course the symptoms were triggered. But actually it is just something that's just, it is there. It's not always something that has to be triggered consistently by a certain thing. And actually being able to go and realize that, go out and do things, realize a big part of what makes it so unpleasant is actually the sense of injustice and the anxiety and the fear response that comes with it. And just over time been able to go and do things and eventually leave a, lead a normal life again yeah 100 percent. yeah no you just read that exactly exactly right so it's it's not easy though is it? it's kind of one of those things that you just say like hey can you just accept it and move on and it's obviously not that easy to do and that's why that cognitive behavioral therapy is such an important part of the of the vestibular rehab therapy we do that you, you kind of really have to help people get into that like you can't just i think being zen and being um you know, like present is really easy when life is great and really impossible when life is tough. So basically it just comes down to practicing it a lot of trying to, you know, take that moment, take a breath, just when that anxiety starts building up or that frustration builds up too much, just, you know, actually, how am I right now? Like it's okay, I'm not having the best day, but I have actually managed to still cook the kids dinner 
and uh, I've still gone for a walk. You know, that's great. So I'm not going for a run, but I'm taking going for a walk, looking after the dog. I actually did, a, you know, I've, I managed to do my emails today. So it's kind of trying to really make note of those small wins because actually it's those small wins that are your life. And so it's it's when you look at the big picture and you say, oh, I'm not running a marathon anymore. That's when it already just crush you. But well, for you, you know, you might be saying, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not, comp I'm not competing at my highest level, but you're still like way, you know, I, I was joking around with you a little while back trying to do some calisthenics and I can't do it at all. And you were just like smacking out. So your, your, your low is still way better than my high. So it's trying to take these little steps and be like, actually, you know, what are the little wins today? And just know that as you start to improve, it won't be linear line. You will have these, these little hiccups. The people who do great are the ones who can absorb those, those, those bumps and be like, okay, it's been a rough couple of days, but actually the last few days were pretty good. The ones who, who will struggle more, the ones who are like, oh, I've had bad days and now it's going to get back to how it used to be and the symptoms skyrocket. Absolutely. Unfortunately, those, those, you know, there is a time place for medication. Um, I, I don't think that we should be starting frontline with medications. We should be doing conduit variable therapy, mindfulness, breathing, vestibular rehab that's graded and just trying to work through these progressively more challenging exercises that are challenging but not stressful. If you increase stress, you just increase that visual dependency. Um, and then we want to say if at some point we find someone cannot, you know, if the, the psychology, uh, and, and remember, it's, it's not just you're thinking badly. Triple PD is a functional disorder. So it's a bit like P PTSD. We don't look at some with PTSD and say like, could you not be so stressed? Like, come on, just don't, don't think about it. Don't be stressed. Like we recognize there's functional uh, patterns that, that are changing their, in their brain waves and the way their brain is thinking. It's like that with, with Triple PD. So we kind of don't blame people for it. It's just how it is. The, the syndrome itself changes the way you think, but we can, we can change that again, but just these little regular patterns. So Ben, we're going to be keep, keep going through the kind of latest research on different types of chronic dizziness. So we'll, we'll get the next one sorted and, and see how else we can help people with these conditions. Yeah, excited to.